and welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders, the show where I interview the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate, and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the incredible Paul Cisse. Paul is the founder of multiple organizations which focus specifically on diversity and inclusion. So I'm really looking forward to having him on the show. Paul founded the Inclusive Top 50 Employers, as well as founded the National Diversity Awards. He's had a really colorful and interesting career, everything from founding his own businesses through to being a sports journalist, which I'm dying to ask him more about today. I think he's live today from Liverpool, which is one of my favorite cities in the world. So I'm hoping he actually is in Liverpool. Paul, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be, uh, to be on your show. Thank you so much. And I'm sure everyone in the Northwest knows exactly who you are and all the wonderful things that you've done to really change the face of business when it comes to inclusive leadership and also to embracing positive diversity. But tell all of our listeners who perhaps haven't heard of you um, a little bit about some of the current projects that you're working on at the moment and a summary of, of the various different types of businesses that you run today, Paul. Thank you for having me on your show, Layla. Um, an amazing individual yourself as well. Real trailblazer with diversity and inclusion. And uh, I often follow you on LinkedIn and your podcast and, uh, and we'll continue to do so. So yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I run quite a few diversity and inclusion initiatives. Uh, one being the National Diversity Awards, which is the uh, UK's largest diversity award, all about celebrating positive role models community organisations and people that do exceptions in the community. Um, we had 25,000 nominations and votes last year. Wow. And, uh, and it's a truly national event as well. Um, and one thing that sets us apart is everybody from every single strand of diversity, the LGBT, race, disability, age, religion, um, you know, whatever background you are from, people are celebrated. And, and the beauty of it is you could be in the awards and it's kind of how um, society should be like. Everybody should be accepted for who they are, what they stand for, but everybody stands, um, you know, together as well uh, as one, as human, as the human race. So we absolutely love it. Um, and we've had winners that are just unbelievable. So one that stands out is uh, he's, he's got autism, a young black kid with autism. He's one of the world's biggest child geniuses. He's got autism and he basically, he uh, started, um, Mastering phonics when he was three, he could speak Mandarin by the age of six. Uh, no, by the age of four, should I say? By the age of six, he went to Oxford University and studied philosophy and passed with distinctions. And uh, now he lectures in over ninety countries about diversity and inclusion, and also about autism. Um, and he also uh, lectures on the human anatomy. So those are the types of people that we promote on, on the actual um, diversity awards. I wow. also do the it is amazing. Um, I also do the inclusive top 50 UK employers. And, and it came about of, I was seeing lots of benchmarks out there and lots of organisations promoting that. I have one or two strands um, saying that they are diverse. Um, but I didn't have the answer to who's the most inclusive employer in the UK. Um, and being from a background where I'm very inquisitive and I want, I want to make, see, real, see real change in society, I wanted that answer. Um, and so it started the Inclusive Top 50. And basically, it's a benchmark for organizations to sign up to um, to see how inclusive they are across every strand of diversity. It's no good having one or two strands and saying you're very diverse. It's all about inclusivity, not just at um, uh, operational level, but senior and boardroom level as well. Um, and that's grown um, to many, many organizations signing up to that. And uh, and it's and it's gaining a lot of notoriety within the diversity and inclusion world. So we've got Companies like Sky, we've got companies like Bloomberg, as well as charities and housing, housing education that are all signed to the public sector as well, police, um, police ambulance services and NHSs as well. So it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing benchmark. Um, and then we also do the inclusive companies membership, which is uh, basically we help organisations um, on their journey to be more inclusive. Um, and so that could be like leadership, it could be um, audits that we do, internal audits to see, you know, what the progress is like within their organisation. Um, and we also consult 
bit. I feel exhausted just listening to how <laughs> much incredible work you've done, Paul. That's absolutely mm. wonderful. And if you don't mind me asking, just rewinding the clock a number of years, you've obviously had a very, very interesting background. And I was reading all up about you having been formerly a sport presenter which is very unique and different. And I wondered, what actually made you get into the field of DNI? What made you set up the businesses? Was it something that happened specifically within your childhood or within your growing up? Talk to me a little bit about the young Paul and the young Paul that went into TV, radio type, pre-setting up his own business. I've always been surrounded. So I was fostered when I was a child and I was fostered by many different types of families um, and in different institutions as well. And some good, some really, really bad. Um, but it really opened my eyes up to what it was like to live with as a child with different parents, different um, types of individuals. Um, and it made me a strong person myself. And um, it's, uh, and when I look back to my childhood, you know, some of it was very upset, like I said, but I wouldn't regret I don't regret any of it because it's, it, it made me a strong person. And um, when I was 19, I'm not going to go into my whole childhood, but when I was 19, I'd had enough of these where, where I was born. Um, I'd had a lot of upheaval. Um, I was in the streets of, of Chapel Town, which is the black area in, in Leeds. And um, and basically, um, the streets was my friends. You know, people on the streets. And, and but I knew that wasn't the life that I wanted to go into. Um, so I moved to Liverpool when I was 19. And it was a friend that took me under his wing, um, basically. When he first seen me, he says, oh, I like you. And uh, it was his name was James Glass. And he fed me. I had no clothes. I moved to Liverpool with £25 in my pocket. My clothes, that was it. I had no family. Um, no one around me that, that even to know. So, But I don't know why I ended up in Liverpool. I just knew it was the place that I wanted to go. Um, and... Um, and Basically, he showed me, he was a radio DJ for radio, BBC Radio Merseyside. And he, he, he basically showed me what it's like to achieve. And I'd never seen that before in my life. You know, I'd always be put down by various foster families or, um, you know, on the streets. You know, it's not a nice place to be. And he, and he basically showed me what you could achieve. And so I used to MC around the clubs and he used to MC with me. So he used to call me his apprentice. Um, and that was a catalyst for me to start believing in myself. And that was completely different to what I do now. But um, it was it was, it was was a real catalyst for me to start believing in myself. And that is oh. such a heartwarming story. I'm just picturing it as you're telling me this story. I know Chapel Town well. Grew up in Harrogate. One of my best friends lives in Chapel Town, actually. So yeah. I know the area and I know Liverpool as well, which I think is a fabulous city. So, yeah. you know, already I'm getting a real sense of the, you know, the true bravery and courage that it took as a young guy to really move out of your comfort zone and suddenly uproot and sticks to to Liverpool where you know fortunately there was a, a good a good friend who was willing to kind of embrace you into his inner circle and help you along the way and clearly that's impacted you significantly when it comes to where you are right now because you're a very successful businessman um, if you don't mind me saying so, and I'm sure many do look up to you. So it's really nice to see how the tables have turned. So it's all about role models in society, and and, and that's my point. It was one role model that took me under his wing. And look at what I've achieved from that. You know, I've set up various diverse inclusion initiatives that are truly national in its entirety. And I'm making a difference to many people in, in society. Um, and continuing with the story, um, he's... We, I started the business in 2006, and again, it was also the frustration of. I worked for a, a, a magazine called Diverse Liverpool, mm -hmm. and it was great, it was a great magazine. Um, uh, not putting anything down about it, it was it was fantastic, but it wasn't touching on the things that I wanted to touch upon. And then I moved to another equality and diversity um, organisation um, when I when in 2003, I think it was, and. Um, and again, I was so frustrated about what they were promoting and, and there wasn't any belief in, in what they was doing. They were just basically making money from it and, and there was no conviction in it. There, was no, there wasn't doing any initiatives. Um, and so um, I set my own business up in 2006 with a pretense of promoting diversity and inclusion as a whole. And that's always been my message, inclusion for everyone, not just one person, not one strand, not two strands, but everybody in society. 
Um, and uh, we started with the diversity group and we started off with wall planners um, and I, I had a little office, I, another guy that took me under his wing and I asked him, can I lend your office? Um, I, I had an idea about what I wanted to do and um, and so I had to get on the phone and, and it was just basically um, getting generic adverts on a wall planner about diversity and companies come up in their generic diversity inclusion stance. Um, I did that for six months. I started a directory, which went out to lots of community organizations and colleges and, um, and universities. And it, it, it was, uh, it was a, a directory that had lots of information on how, what you need to do when you feel like you've been discriminated against, what you need to do to find a job, and lots of organizations that are uh, willing to put, um, you know, willing to promote diversity and willing to have an inclusion agenda within their organization. Unfortunately, it was mainly public sector back in, in, in them days, and then the recession happened, and literally all diversity went down the pan. There was, there was no, no one wanted to promote diversity. It was like, okay, you know, we're making redundancies, so we can't promote diversity at all. So you had teams of like 10 to 15 that are now down to actually zero teams or just one. Um, that, you know, and it, and 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 before that, I think it was actually getting somewhere. You know, the rhetoric in the UK, I think people was being more accepting of different faiths, different religions, different people from different countries. Um, I actually thought we was getting somewhere, but we still had a long way to go. And um, so, um, I had to really, you know, really think about what I wanted to do next. And um, and I realised at that time when people was getting persecuted and hate crime went up and so on and so forth that. We need to do something um, about role models, and the, and and the conservatives have this thing about um, the big idea. I think it was or the big what was it called? I can't remember. It was turns it out the the big community in, in the UK. But I wanted to really promote the role models that um, that are really keeping society going because community organisations and uh, people in the communities, you know, there was no money going in there. So we, we I wanted to do something about it. So I started the National Diversity Award. I was adopted by, by British parents, so I was born in Hong Kong, and my brother and I were both adopted by British parents. They went out there, the very working class worked for the NHS, because there, there was a lack of radiographers, basically, in Hong Kong, and so mum went out there, and then my dad went out there as well, and we, we lived there for a number of years pre-coming to Yorkshire, and you know, I remember and I can feel kind of this passion and almost the pain in your story when you're retelling it and reliving it because it was clearly very difficult for you growing up. Now, you know, obviously, whilst I wasn't in a foster home, I feel very, very lucky and very privileged that I've grown up with such a wonderful family. It was not easy being the only Chinese child or one of two with my brother in a Absolutely. very white middle class school in Harrogate. Yeah. And you know, for whatever reason, I seem to be attracted to, A, the weird and wonderful people. I, I wasn't the most cool in school. You know, my best friend was Jamaican, actually, and I met her when I was 17 doing a promotion in Leeds. She still lives in Chapel Town to this day. And yeah. I see the community around there. Like you say, I know it is kind of, you know, the streets, your friends kind of thing. I went a bit off the rails it's and everything like that. Did things I shouldn't have done. Yeah. But you know, I know that area quite well and I know I I can relate to the feelings of being quite different and being frustrated and thinking outside the box and kind of wanting to make it on your own and wanting to do something because you kind of, or at least it feels to me like you, you've you kind of wanted to prove something, whether it's to yourself, whether it's to other people, that actually you can do something, you can have a voice and you are worthy of of doing what you're doing. And you know, clearly you're doing a super ace job. Getting back to that, you know, I used to, when I was in school and certain foster homes that I went to, I was the only black kid in the school. And I used to wonder, you know, I used to want to paint myself white sometimes. Like, you know, I wasn't being oh. expected. Oh my God, you know. me too. I used to want to be blonde with blue eyes. That's all I wanted. I was like, oh God, I want to be blonde. I, that's, do you know what? That makes me cry hearing you say that because it is, um, I can relate to it so much. But the saying that though, I, really, I I kind of accepted that I was black, and I was into a lot of black culture things when I was growing up. So I used to listen to Run DMC and a lot of um, yeah, reggae. Yeah, Run DMC. I was around my family, so you know, I was always aware of my 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 own identity, as it were. So it, it, it was crazy. Um, but you know, like I say, it's 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 one of those leads, especially leads in the seventies and eighties, were a very racist place as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so, as you probably know, um, you know, growing up in them places, people were calling you, you know, there, N-word and various sort of things. It was, mm-hmm. it was a nice place to go to. And one story that I can really relate to is I was with a foster family and um, I just moved in there, literally, and the film Zulu came on. And, uh, and I was seven at the time, maybe six or seven. And there was going, oh, there's your grandma. There. This is the whole family there. And I'm the only mm-hmm. black kid in there. These are the people that are looking after me. There's your grandma there in the films. There's your, there's your mom. There's your... I was like, wow. Do you know what I mean? You think back to these situations. At the time, you don't think about it. But when you look back, you think, there's just no there. Crazy. Oh, it is. It's unbelievable. But I think back then, people just... I'm not saying that they weren't intentionally meaning to be racist, but I don't think, you know, they clearly had not seen many people who looked like you or who looked like me. And I certainly didn't have many role models, to your point, that looked or sounded like me. I can think of maybe Miley in class or even in my last, when I was employed for the very short time of a year and a half, because I've not worked for people for, for much of my life. I've mainly had my own businesses. Yeah. But, um, you know, <laughs> they all used to call me Gok Wan because it was the only yeah. person that, like, resembles, you know, someone who was yeah. Chinese there who is well-known, I guess, in, in film. And um, yeah. in childhood growing up, I remember there was girls who were younger than me that used to tease me and they used to say, oh, if you had... Um, a mum who was Japanese and Chinese and your eyes would look like this. And, you know, and it kind of, it makes me laugh now, but you know, at the time you just kind of hide away and you think, Oh, this must be normal. But actually yeah. it probably does affect you as you get older, because you feel this constant need to be able to prove yourself. And I think you don't realize until you get older that actually embracing that real, true, authentic difference is a massive yeah. positive. And that's how I feel now. And I'm sure that you feel this too, or if you don't, you definitely should do, that actually being different and having that really wonderful, colourful story that's not always been swings and roundabouts is actually, that makes you who you are. That makes you have the drive and resilience that you have today. And you know what? No one can take that away from you. But if it wasn't through role models, you know, when I moved to Liverpool, you know, people was asking me, do you want to do this package or sell this kind of drug because I moved to Toxic, which is the black area in Liverpool. And, um, in, you know, in the importance of community organisations, like there's a company called SLP, which is basically helping people in the local community get jobs, get them out of bed, you know, get them get them interviews for, for certain organisations. That, that wasn't, and there's nothing like that a, anymore in a, any of these communities. There was even a college called the Charles Wooten Centre in Liverpool, which was helping people that failed in school to go to take the GCSEs again. And I went there and actually gave me £50 a week to actually go there, which was an incentive to go there. And I actually yeah. got all my GCSEs from that and went to college to study uh, computer game production. Um, you know, and, and, and it's such a cry and shame in, in, in today's society that these infrastructures are no longer there, um, which is, is sadly needed. And it only takes a few simple things to actually, you know, to make a difference in... Uh, especially social economic background, people from social economic backgrounds, it only takes a few simple things to actually change that. So, um, and it's something that I'm really passionate about, so that I'm going to be concentrating on uh, maybe later on down the line. Um, because when I look to, um, and it's not just a black thing or it's not just a, an Asian thing, it's it's a social economic um, thing. Because when you look at kids from like, say, Bootle or inner city areas or all across the UK, whether they're white, whether they're black, they're still lost and don't have the opportunities that that they should have. Do you know what I mean? It's, absolutely, it's absolutely. And we have that responsibility, and perhaps you and I feel it more because we are individuals of colour and we maybe have grown up a bit different. So we want to yeah. give voice to the underdog. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all, but... I mean, we should be trying to present opportunities and trying to educate and inspire youngsters, especially who don't necessarily have that privileged start in life. And I think as adults, we have got that responsibility. I think everyone does to really help those who are less fortunate than themselves and to help give confidence and voice to those individuals. The same guy that took me under his wing, who was MC at uh, Top to Radio, he sadly passed away um, with cancer. Uh, cancer um, and he filled out the uh, Anglican Cathedral, which is Europe's biggest cathedral. Um, and he filled it out. And people are standing at the back, wishing him well. Um, so not only had he influenced me, and I was privileged to know, and I lived with the guy, he took me in his wing, he took me in his house, but 
he influenced not just his black community, but there was people from everywhere, all over the city that was wishing him well. Now, I'd be looking to fill out a couple of people in the church, uh, you know, when, when I die, but to I'm fill sure out a, a cathedral is, is an unbelievable feat. And so he was the catalyst for me starting the National Diversity Wars because the National Diversity Wars came about, you know, it is about role model society. And he didn't know what role model he was when he de- before he died. I know he didn't. He just thought he was just going about everyday business, just doing his thing, but he didn't know how many people he'd influenced. So I wanted to create something that did something like that. So when we do the National Diversity Awards website, I made sure that every single person that's nominated has their own page. So when they go onto that page and they do a lot of write up on about what they do, then um, people can then write really nice things about them and say, you know, you've inspired me in this and you've inspired me to do that. And it, it, whether they win or lose or get shortlisted, it still helps them as, as, a, as, a, as a community organization or as a role model to sit there and say, well, actually, I am making a difference. And just by people saying that to them can, can it spare them on tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold. It's, it's, it's really, it's really that's why the National Diversity Wars came about. And it is making a difference. And the other thing that I, what I love about it is it's, um, it's bringing different communities that wouldn't ordinarily come together be together, so an LGBT charity working with a Muslim charity or, you know, uh, a disabled charity working with a, a race charity, do you know what I mean? That's, it's bringing people together and, and highlight, you know, the good work that each community, each strand does, but actually, you know, cohesion is, 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 a, strong, is a strong thing as well. Mm-hmm. That is so inspiring to hear and so wonderful um, in terms of storytelling about your friend and how he filled the whole church with people that he's inspired. I think it's really nice as well, the idea of bringing together these different unique communities that wouldn't necessarily speak. And I think that is one of the possible challenges that as diversity and inclusion practitioners we do face is that whilst it's great to put together employee resource groups and things like this actually often you are building these different communities that then feel I guess safety in numbers and sometimes stick together so actually being able to really spread that inclusive message and get them to speak to one another so they can learn positive traits and share unique stories with each other is really really important. Being in this arena for a long time, I, I, you know, I, I see so many people jumping on the diversity bandwagon, as it were, that really don't know about diversity. And um, and I'd really urge organizations to look at who's behind that organization, what they do, what their background is. Is it just that they are looking at diversity policies or are you actually taking actions to actually go into the community to attract talent in all levels of your organization? That's what inclusion is about. And for too long, it's been about, you know, just talking about, oh, you know, they know they're not diverse. They see that in the office. You don't need a, a, a benchmark to tell you that you need to do better. You just need to take actions. And that's what I'm all about is trying to create organizations to, to, to get action. And, my, my, and what we start to do is because we have 25,000 nominations and votes each year, we, we've got that community aspect to our, to our consultancy, as it were. So we want to create something where organizations, and we hear this time and time again, organizations come to us and say, you know, we, we, we find it hard to get into the communities and we can help them do that. Um, you know, so if you're in, you're in London and you want to tap into the LGBT community, then we can help them do that. If you're a race community, disability community, we can help them do that. And that way you can get the very best talent that's out there. And all you have to do is come to the awards itself and you will see so much diverse talent all across the UK, not just in London, but everywhere. Look at you you're from Harrogate, I'm from Leeds um, and Liverpool. There's people up in Scotland that are doing amazing stuff, but often get overlooked because they don't have the right postcode or from the right area. And it's about organisations looking outside of the box to see actually where the talent is. And that's what we want to try and do with these companies. Uh- Absolutely. And firstly, I can't wait to come to your diversity awards and to support you moving forwards. I think there's so many different things that we'd be able to collaborate on here, especially with our new business, Dial Global, which we're doing a number of yeah. different events and such like around the world. Um, but I also just yeah. wanted to ask you another couple of quick questions just before I wrap up and kind of summarize some of the incredible key learning points from today. So I'm going to go into yeah. a quick 
I'm going to call it a lightning round and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer each of the next questions. They are super easy, so don't worry about it at all. Um, but I wonder, first and foremost, if you were going to give your younger self advice, the young Paul, and you could have your time again, or if there are people who are out there listening, and I know that there are in and amongst many of our listeners are trying to make it in their career. Some of them are seasoned directors or CEOs. But what kind of advice might you have given yourself when you were younger? And what advice might you give people who are listening at the moment who are trying to make it further within their careers? Um, what advice would I give my younger self? Um, I, 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 there's certain things I wouldn't change, my, like my resilience. And I think I'd say to anybody, be resilient, um, you know, um, because that's that's the key to success. Um, you will always get knockdowns, especially in business, as you well know, Leila. Um, you have your ups and downs, but it's about thinking outside the box. Um, have a genuine passion for something um, that that you have, um, and and that's what I'd say to my younger self. You know, look, seek out the opportunities that I wouldn't seek out otherwise. Sometimes a community, when you're inside a community, they can. Sometimes, sometimes hold you back a, a little bit because, um, you know, when I was walking around the streets of Chapel Town, you see people that with you know, nice gold chains and nice cars and you can easily get sucked into that kind of lifestyle because you think to yourself, wow, you know, I want that, I want this car, I want this. But what I say to my younger self is don't get sucked in by that. Actually, you know, you can get that legitimate. You don't need to sit there and, and sell drugs or do bad things to do that. You can actually get a career, be a professional, have an idea about an entrepreneur, go and do it. Do you know what I mean? Don't just sit on it, go and actually do it. And that's, and that's what I do. I think, I think, and any advice that I would say to anybody, it's a gift from God. If you've got an idea, the national diversity was my calling. And lots of people have these, these callings all the time. And, um, and I'd say, just go for it and just, just, just don't look back and take each step at a time, but carry on doing what you're doing. That's, that's what I'd say to myself and anybody that not just myself but anybody that's out there that wants to progress in life that's fantastic advice and I know that you've probably mentioned one of the key people in your life that's really inspired you the individual who is a role model who had a full church when he, he sadly passed away but I wonder are there any any other key inspirations or heroes or sheroes, as I like to call them, that have really made a difference to you in your life or are people that you really look up to? Um, my family, uh, my immediate family, so my my children, uh, my my missus, because, you know, when you're growing up and, you, and, you, and you've had no love in, and, and, and as you, you was adopted, but when sometimes when you go through foster families, you don't get any love there. You're just there as a, as a stay gap. Some people are just there for money. See, I never had that love. So when I actually had my own children and the love and the unconditional love that my children can give, it's it's unbelievable. And so they're real role models for me to, to carry on doing what I'm doing. And But it also, because my children are obviously of mixed race as well, my missus is from half, half Asian, um, half wise, um, you know, I want them to have the same opportunities uh, or even better opportunities. I just want them to have equal opportunities. It, it really saddens me that my son or my daughter might not have the same opportunities because of the color of their skin. Do you know what I mean? And uh, and 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 so that's that that gives me inspiration to carry on doing what I'm doing. But I have to say though, um, and I'm going back to the previous thing, is that people in this in I've met so many wonderful people um, in this diversity arena, some real trailblazers, trailblazers that are helping each other to, to progress and are helping, you know, helping the agenda move forward. And we actually are getting somewhere bit by bit where we've got so much more to go. But it's, uh, but you know, I'd like to, you know, there's so many people out there that do so much stuff. Um, and it's fantastic, such as yourself, Leila, a real passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure all of our listeners do. And um, because we're coming to the end of our time for today, what I'm going to do is just summarize some of the real, genuinely, they were real pills of wisdom from today. And what I really love about you, Paul, and I'm sure all of our listeners do, is that probably the word authentic is maybe a little overused these days, but you have got this real, true authenticity and this likability because you can feel that you have come from 
a real gritty background and you've absolutely worked your socks off to be where you are today. But you've also enjoyed what you've done and you've enjoyed that journey. And I think you as an inspiration for many others who are out there, executives, seasoned executives, or those who are young and going up through the ranks in their career, or even those who are perhaps trying to find their feet and have not maybe got the right role models around them. I really hope that there's many of those who are listening and they can glean some some wisdom from, from what you've said today. Now, I've written down a couple of notes here just from our chat on the podcast today, and some of the pieces that really came through as, as being fantastic learnings are to really believe in yourself. Now, you're a great inspiration for those who want to make a difference in society, and I think that is within all of our reach. There's no excuse for not being engaged with trying to make a real difference. It can be frustrating at times, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for those out there who are trying to make a difference and not managing to. All I would say to to people like that is to really keep pushing through and keep going at it with conviction because eventually the more people you speak to, the more likely you are to have people who are going to say yes. And when you do find people or mentors or inspirers in life who like Paul, now takes many people underneath his wing and he's had people take him under their wing over the years make sure you stick to these people as long as they're good influencers and they're willing to back you to the hilt be loyal to them and really utilize them as a springboard in a positive way to help you get further within your career in a positive way and finally be resilient Paul's a great example of someone who can be successful having come from what was a very challenging background. So if you have similarities or that story resonates with you a lot, please do reach out and get in touch. Don't be scared to absolutely go for it and show unconditional love. If you'd like to reach out to Paul or myself, or you've got any questions at all from today's podcast, please do get in touch. I'm going to put all of Paul's details down into the notes from today's podcast. I'll put everything there about his current business and also about the National Diversity Awards, which are fantastic. So please do reach out to the team and apply if you haven't done so already. And I guess all that is left for me to say is thank you so much, Paul. It's been a really inspirational story that you've told and I really appreciate you sharing some of those personal details of your story with everyone on the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me and uh, keep doing what you're doing because it's an amazing work. Thanks so much, Paul. My name is Leila McKenzie and you've been listening to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders, the podcast now with you every week, available on Apple, Spotify, Android, or your favorite podcast app. You can also view our new YouTube channel, which is available under Dial Global, which stands for Diverse, Inclusive, Aspirational Leaders Global, or you can visit www laylamckenzie.com forward slash podcasts where you'll be able to see all of our previous episodes and you'll be able to find out much more about Paul and see all of the show notes from today. Until next week, thank you so much for listening. Take care and see you soon. Bye for now. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.